All right, Winter on the Plain of Ghosts, a novel of Mahenjadaro by Eileen Kernahan. Mahenjadaro, this um, takes place in the Indus Valley, which is a, a pre-Indo-European site. Um, so the author tells us not to uh, try to read uh, anything of modern Indian culture or uh, religion into into this book. Um, not a lot has been written about Mahenjadaro and this uh, this is just a, a wonder it's one of my favorite books actually. It's a wonderfully written, very interesting and very evocative novel. I'll just lunge right in. Prologue. This morning when I visited the warehouse Akala was breaking the seal on a chest full of luxury goods, among them some jars of unguent imported from the western des deserts of Maluha. I took one home with me and opened it in the privacy of my bedchamber. Released from its stone container, the rich, oily perfume awoke a rush of memories. Once again I breathed the fragrance of oleander, growing high up on a des in a desolate hill pass. I heard the throbbing of the skin drums, the wistful music of the reed pipes, and the shrill voice of the desert wind crying across the parched, dun-colored plain. But underneath the scent of spice and sun and flowers, there was a hint of something darker, muskier, a cloying, sweet-sour odor of the swamp. And there rose in my mind's eye a vision of the great Maluhan capitals, those once noble cities of the plains. I saw them crouched behind their crumbling walls like enormous, stricken animals, choking on their own poisoned breath. Already it is the month of Nisan. The floodwaters are rising, and another year is almost over. I have lived long, have, I believe, sinned no worse than other men, have suffered much, and have received many blessings from the gods. It is, at this moment, as though I am standing on a high terrace from which it is possible to look down upon my life's beginning and on its end. And so in this city of Ur, in the reign of the great king Rim Sin of Larsa, I, the merchant captain Rujik, set down my history, having instructed my storekeeper to lay in a great quantity of clay. My first clear memory is of a journey along a narrow, treacherous path, with crags and precipices above and a rushing torrent of water below. One image follows another, a glitter of ice on bare black rock, snow falling, huge, soft flakes borne slantwise on the wind. The river, a jade-green ribbon coiled at the base of sheer grey cliffs. I remember mountains, snow-clad, luminous in sunlight or veiled in mist, and beyond them, always, other mountains. Much earlier there had been another place, a land of yellow air, yellow sky and earth and crumbling yellow rock, above which there rose a long, cloud-suspended ridge of flame-red peaks, and there had been warm arms holding me as I rocked and swayed on the back of some tall, slow-moving beast. I cannot say where that country was, or if it has been charted on any map, though I know there are few places on this earth where the merchant caravans have not traveled. I possess to this day a small lump of polished jade stone on a cord of silk. It is the only legacy I have ever had, and the only clue to my birthplace, unless one counts a certain odd breadth of cheekbone, a coppery cast of skin, and hair that, though it is white now, was once the color of new-mown wheat. Of that journey's end I remember only dust and searing heat, in an endless waste of grey-brown stone. Somehow, at last, I came to the place where I was to spend my childhood a small village sheltered in a fold of western Maluhas, ochre-colored hills. Book One Dark Goddess They called us the Chosen Ones. We wandered freely through the village, and every door was open to us. 
At every house we were kissed and fondled, praised like small princes and offered honeyed fruits. As children do, we accepted this pampering without question. It was one more blessing, we thought, from our loving and benevolent goddess. Every village had its particular goddess, though I suppose in truth they were simply aspects of the one great mother who governed us all. Our goddess was called Yamash, and she lavished many gifts upon our village. All around was mountainous, stony desert, where flocks of scrawny goats and sheep grazed on thorn scrub and stiff grass, and gaunt, patient women gathered the grain harvest stalk by stalk into meager sheaves. But in our valley there was shelter from the hot, harsh wind and a year-round supply of water. Some earlier folk had built stone dams and ditches to contain the water that roared down from the high peaks in flood time. And so in our village we led a charmed existence among date palms and flourishing green fields. Still, as we were to discover, Yamasha's favors had their price. I lived with the headman of the village and his wife in a large stone house with white plastered walls. The wife was called Tavashi. She was a plump, placid creature who loved me as generously and uncritically as she loved her own extensive brood. It was she who bestowed on me the name Rujik, which in their language means yellow-haired. I was not a child much given to introspection, or else I might have wondered that the largest lump of goat meat always found its way to, into my bowl. Nor did I question that there was always a new homespun kilt for me, though the other children of the house wore patched and threadbare garments. Once, when Tavashi had gone to the well for water, I stole into the house and picked up her mirror, a prized possession she had forbidden us to touch. Until that day I had never seen my face except as a distorted reflection in a polished kettle, or a fragmented glimpse in the stream that ran through the people grove, the people tree grove. I had known that I was different from the others, but even so I was astonished to confront this thin face with its broad, high cheekbones, copper-flecked green eyes, and bright bush of yellow hair. Truly it was the face of a being from another world. In our village there were perhaps half a dozen other foster children scattered among as many households. I remember a pair of curly-haired, dark-skinned twins who may have come from the Maluhan River Plains, and a round-faced girl with slanted eyes. The others have vanished from memory, all but Bima, who was nearest in age to myself and my special friend. I can see her now as clearly as if it were yesterday. Tiny and light-boned she was, with large, dark-rimmed, tender eyes like a gazelle's, and a fierce knife-blade of a nose. She told me that she came from a desert country over many mountains. Only once during the year was our freedom curbed. Ten days before fall, sewing the floorboards of our foster houses, before fall sewing, the floorboards of our foster houses were taken up, and each of us was thrust alone into a windowless cellar with a single oil lamp to hold back the dark. Twice a day our meals were handed down to us. We never knew if we were being punished or protected from some unknown danger. Then one day Tavashi explained to me in her gentle voice that this was a ritual going back to the first age of the world. By means of this yearly ordeal, we chosen ones learned the true nature of man's life on earth, a time of bondage, suffering, and endurance, from which the Dark One, the Terrible Mother, would one day release us into enlightenment and bliss. After ten days we emerged into the hot dazzle of the upper world. Everyone in the village embraced us. We were bathed in flower-scented oils, dressed in new garments, fed on melons and honeyed figs. It seemed to us that we had indeed been reborn into an earthly paradise. Each year it became more evident that we were singled out for some high destiny yet to be revealed. Each year, too, we grieved for one of our number, the oldest always, who during our time of trial had been mysteriously struck down by illness. But it was the brief, uncomprehending sorrow of children. That friend, that foster brother or sister, the adults told us, had gone to live with the goddess in the garden behind the winds. How pleasant, we thought, 
to walk in those sweet-scented orchards, to lie in the cool shade of pomegranate trees, to bathe in lapis-colored streams. I imagined the goddess waiting there, a large, smiling, calm-faced protectress with brown, bangled arms outstretched in welcome. The autumn that I was twelve, I learned that I was to share my captivity. Bima's foster mother had died in childbirth, and Bima was sent to live in Tavashi's household. I was glad of this news, for I had been dreading the loneliness and boredom of confinement. I knew that Bima, who was a bold-natured, talkative child, would be lively company. Yet when Bima arrived on our doorstep with her few treasures rolled up in a blanket, she looked wan and ill, and her eyes were swollen, half shut from weeping. "'Do you grieve so for your foster mother?' I asked. For answer, she gave me a strange, haunted look and jerked her head away. Then, just before they put us into the cellar, she reached out and caught my hand. When I felt the desperate pressure of that small, damp palm, I knew that fear, not grief, had robbed her of her voice. As the board slid into place above us, shutting out the air and light, I stood beside Bima and gripped her hand hard. She crept closer to me, and I could hear the quick, nervous flutter, flutter of her breath. At length, she said, in a scared, shaking voice, Ruchik, this year it is your turn, and next year it will be mine.